Simply play Brass Birmingham. When we open the box, we find the game instructions, the board, four player mats and color-coded material for up to four players and more, which we will get to in a moment. It's best to get everything out and sorted and unfold the game board. Here, as with the individual player mats, you can decide whether you prefer to play on the dark or light side. However, this has no influence on the game itself. Setup. First, take the cards and sort out all the wild cards. In contrast to the normal cards, they are light colored with a white border. Depending on how many players are participating, for four players all location and industry cards are to be taken. For three players, only those that show two and three dots in the lower right corner and are kept in blue. For two players, only those cards that show two, three and four dots together. So the greenish and bluish cards are dropped. The cards showing only the four dots are normally for the four player game only. If you want to extend the game against the rule, you can ignore this sorting and play with more cards than intended for the number of players. However, this also means that the two or three players may be less crowded on the board and interaction will be reduced. Each player takes a player mat, all the game material of his color, eight cards from the shuffled deck and coins worth 17 pounds. The square industrial tiles are sorted onto your own player mats with the one colored side facing up. Make sure that the Roman numerals in the upper right corner of the cards match the position on the player mats. In addition to the player mat, you now have the coins, the eight cards, several double-sided link tiles and two wooden markers. Place the hexagonal wooden marker at the bottom left of the board on the zero, respectively minus 10 position and place the round marker on the position 10, respectively zero. The round marker marks the income per round via the light in a numbering. The square marker indicates your victory points. The latter will not move until the second half of the game with some exceptions. With this, each player has his material ready to play. Now there is still work to be done on the board. In the center right of the board you will see the market for coal and iron. Place the black coal cubes on the black squares and leave the one slightly lighter area at the bottom empty. Do the same with the orange iron cubes to the right, leaving two squares free at the bottom. Besides coal and iron there is a third resource, beer. Place the wooden beer barrels on the positions of the different product marketplaces. If you have four players, you occupy all positions around the landscape. If there are fewer players, you leave the upper half of the board empty. On the top left of the board, there are three places for cards. These can be used for the three piles, draw deck, wild location cards and wild industry cards. Now there are the merchant tiles. While the handshake side is the same for all of them, the other side shows certain industrial goods or sometimes nothing. Shuffle the tiles face down, place them on the appropriate merchant spaces next to the beer barrels and then turn them face up. They now show which goods can be traded at this marketplace. The corresponding beer barrels are rewards for the first person to sell the indicated goods to that merchant. More on that later. Finally, place your large round character tile on the barrels shown at the bottom left. These mark the player order. You may take one of your eight hand cards and place it as discard pile marker. Although I don't really get why this is necessary. Now everything is finally set up. Game structure. First of all, you need to understand that Brass Birmingham is divided into two phases. The first half is set in the canal era, where goods are transported by boats across canals. The second phase is set in the rail era, now goods are shipped to markets by railroads. The end of each era is triggered when the draw pile as well as all hand cards are used up. Then the victory points are counted, all canal connections and also all level 1 industries are eliminated. You should be clear about this at the beginning of the game, therefore it is said already now. I will explain later how exactly the scoring proceeds. To get victory points you have to either sell industries or get rid of resources like coal, iron and beer, depending on the case. 
As soon as you have done that, you may turn over the industrial tile on the board, which will show how high this industry tile is now to be valued. But how does it start now? Each player may play two actions in his turn. One exception is the very first round, in which every player gets to play just one action in his turn. Each action is signaled by a card in your hand. For most of the actions, the content of the chosen card does not matter as such. You simply choose the one you need the least. The only action that is dependent on the chosen card is building, which brings us to the different actions. The build action is actually the only action that requires a bit more explanation, while the other actions are explained fairly quickly. Each tile on the player mat represents a possible building project. It is built in order from the lowest level to the highest, with some levels having multiple tiles, all of which must be built or developed away in order to be allowed to build the next higher level. There are two types of industries. Firstly, those that produce goods that must be sold to merchants on the edge of the board. And secondly, industries that provide building materials, so to speak, which in turn are needed to build or sell other industries. These building materials are coal, iron and beer. I will explain the latter in the sell action. Coal and iron are needed for construction depending on the industry. Coal and iron are needed for construction depending on the industry. If coal is needed, you need a connection to your own or your opponent's coal mine or to a marketplace which gives you access to coal cubes, which however must also be paid for. To access iron, you don't need any connections. You may serve yourself at the whole board or buy it at the marketplace. Buying resources does not require an extra action, it is part of the build action it is necessary to consider where you can build which industry. Actually, it is inevitable to build a coal mine first. For this, you need either a coal industry card or a location card for a city that allows the coal industry. It is advisable to build a coal mine where there is already a connection to the market, as this will allow you to sell coal cubes straight away. Once you have chosen a suitable location, place the tile on it and the number of coal cubes indicated by the tile. If there is a connection to the market, you may now sell as many of these coal cubes as there are empty places in the coal market and take the corresponding money from the bank. The less coal offered on the market, the more you receive per coal cube sold. The same principle applies to the orange iron cubes, but as mentioned, they don't need any connections to be sold or consumed. If you need coal or iron to build another industry, the same rules apply. Coal needs a direct connection, iron does not. Coal must be consumed from the closest coal mine, iron may be consumed from any location. If there is no iron or coal on mines, they can be bought from the marketplace, but the connection rules still apply. As a coal or iron mine owner, you have an interest in getting rid of the cubes on the tiles, because this allows you to flip it over, which from now on increases your turn income by the number shown at the bottom right. Also the industry and the adjacent canal boats or railroads become worth victory points. In principle this also applies to beer respectively breweries, but more about this under the section sell action. If you choose a location card for the build action, you must build one of the possible industries in that city, but you don't necessarily have to have a connection to your network, as long as you can pay the resource costs that way anyway. However, you will have an interest in building a network of industries connected to merchants and marketplaces since you want to sell the goods. A location card can be a good way to expand in an unoccupied part of the board. If you choose an industry card, it must be part of your network of cities and links, and you must choose a location where that industry is available. Note that in the canal era, each player may only place one industry tile per location, so you're forced to expand. Most of the time, industries must be paid for with money. 
once you have covered the additional costs of money and resources, you may place the industry tile. After that, you place the money you paid next to your character tile. There's another special aspect to the build action, namely overbuilding. As rich in possibilities as the game board seems to be, it can get tight sometimes and it may seem useful or necessary to overbuild an industry tile to get some more victory points for a higher level tile or maybe simply because the resources have run out. It is allowed to build over own industries whether flipped or not. If there were resources on it before, they are replaced by the given number of the new tile. The lower tile becomes obsolete by the overbuilding action and irrelevant for the calculation. It can therefore be put back in the box. There's a special case in which an industry of an opponent may also be overbuilt. If iron or coal are completely used up, for example if there are no more iron cubes on the board and in the market, then an iron mine of an opponent may be overbuilt. However, this applies only to iron and coal and the new tile has always to be a higher level tile of the same industry. Network action. Links are the cardboard tiles printed with a boat and a train on the other side. You use the boat in the canal era and the train in the rail era. With this you connect cities, which by the way do not necessarily have to be built on by yourself, and thus expand your network and increase your industrial construction and sales opportunities. Railroads can be placed almost everywhere. Boats, on the other hand, may only be placed where a canal really connects two cities. Links can be worth victory points in the scoring after an era. More about this later. The costs for boats and railroads can be found at the bottom right of the board. In the canal era, one boat link may be purchased per action for three pounds. In the railroad era, one up to two railroad links may be purchased per action, but they are also significantly more expensive. One for five pounds and one coal, and two pieces for 15 pounds, two coal cubes and one beer. Lawn action. Since the construction of the vast majority of industries involves money costs, taking out a lawn is inevitable. With the lawn action you receive 30 pounds from the bank and have to go back three steps on the income progress track for it. This does not mean the small steps, but the large grouped steps, so the inner scale. If your capital is negative, you have to pay the minus amount to the bank until you are in the plus again by selling goods or using up resources. If you look at the outer and inner numbering ring at the edge of the game board, you will see that it is more favorable to take out a lawn in the lower income range at the beginning than later, where you fall back up to 12 income points for three large steps. So it pays to rather bite the bullet in the beginning and maybe take out several loans. But don't overdo it, because if you don't have any money for the bank at the end of the round, you have to sell a built industry for half the rounded price and can't put them back on your player mat, so it is lost. If that's not enough either, you have to deduct a victory point for every pound not paid if possible. Sell action. Here it should be said for the immersion that in my opinion selling of industries is actually not a well chosen word. Actually it is more like activating a goods factory which then continuously generates income every round. For the sake of simplicity however we will continue to call it sell action. If an industry is built, meaning a tile is placed in a city, the goal is to flip the tile and thus increase income and score victory points. In the case of the resource producing factories, namely brewery, coal and iron mine, this is almost self-explanatory due to the consumption of resources. To enable the sale of goods factories, two conditions must be met. Firstly, there must be a connection to a suitable merchant that will buy the product and secondly, beer must be available for sale. Why beer? The factory is started, the workers go to work and are paid, so to speak, with beer, which at the time of industrialization was apparently safer to drink than dirty water. So the beer can be understood as payment to start production. If you are the first to sell to the appropriate merchant, you will receive the beer as a bonus, which at the same time 
you can use to pay for that very sell action. Another bonus for the first seller is displayed in the middle of the marketplaces, for example a free development action, victory points, increased income, etc. So in this case it is not necessary to build a brewery beforehand, which by the way provides one beer in the canal era and two beers in the rail era. However, it is only a matter of time before the supply of beer becomes probably the most pressing issue. Because without beer, there are no sales and no victory points through goods factories. So beer is the third resource besides coal and iron. If you have an isolated brewery with available beer, you can still use it freely without links to it, just like iron. Opponents, however, may not access it without a connection. Since beer is coveted and relatively rare, it is advantageous to keep your own breweries as isolated as possible, so that opponents cannot snatch away your own beer, which is so urgently needed for sale. Both the number of beer barrels provided on a brewery and the number of beers needed for sale can be found on the respective tiles. When all barrels of a brewery are used up, this tile may also be turned over. Building, selling and consumption often lead to the flipping of tiles and thus to the achievement of their respective objectives. Here you get a foretaste of the chain reactions that can be triggered by individual actions, which often affect not only you, but also the other players since you can help yourself to each other's resources under certain conditions. Develop action during the develop action, up to two industrial tiles may be removed from the player mat for the price of one iron cube each. However, it must be the lowest level available. Also note that some of the pottery tiles have a crossed out light bulb depicted, which means that these tiles may not be developed away, but must be built in order to advance to the next level. The need to develop may arise if you missed building level 1 of an industry in the canal era and now in the railroad era decide to start it after all, because most level 1 industry tiles are not allowed to be built in the second era. So these tiles have to be developed away so to speak. Scout action. By scouting you get to the set brightly colored wildcards. There are two different wildcards as a counterpart to the normal cards one wildcard for locations and one for industries. With the location wildcard you are completely free to choose in which named city you want to build. The industry wildcard allows any industry in any place that is part of your network. The only restriction on both is that you are not allowed to have two of your own industries in one city in the canal era. The wildcards are applied as a build action just like the usual cards. The scout action works as follows. As always, one card is picked out for the action itself and placed in front of you. Next, two more hand cards are chosen to be replaced by the wild cards, namely one location card and one industry card and thrown into one's discard pile. The scout action may not be played if you still have wild cards in your hand. After you use the wild cards, they are not placed on your own discard pile, but back on the board and so they are available for all players to scout again. Advice for keeping track when playing actions. It can sometimes be difficult to keep track of actions, especially when you initiate chain actions by building or selling. It helps to put a corresponding card in front of you for each planned action. In the case of a build action put a corresponding industry tile and its build costs on the card and do the same with the second action. This way you have an overview of which two actions you want to play, what they cost and you still have the option to change the order. Keeping the best possible track leaves your mind free for the fun you can have with the domino effects that keep happening. The end of a turn and a round. At the end of a turn, all the money you have spent on the two actions should be next to your character tile at the bottom left of the board. The cards used for the actions are placed on your own discard pile and the cards in your hand are replenished to 8 from the draw pile. Then the next player follows until everyone has had a turn. At the end of a round, a check is made to see who has spent how many pounds in that round to determine the order of play for the next round. The order is determined in ascending order of the amount spent. 
the thriftiest player starts and the player with the most money spent ends the next round. The end of an era. As mentioned before, the end of each era is initiated by using up the draw pile and hand cards. The end of the canal era is to a large extent a kind of a reset as a lot of things are removed from the board. All link tiles as boats on canals are now considered obsolete and likewise any level 1 industry. But first everything must be converted to victory points. This is the same process both at the end of the first era and the second. First we score the link tiles which are adjacent to locations and merchants. A canal or railroad connection is rated according to its importance which in turn depends on the industries it connects. Here we have to pay attention to this symbol. Thus we see that merchants are always worth two victory points. We can see the connection value of industries per connected boat or railroad on the flipped industry tiles in the upper right corner. Some places have not only one or two but many more potential transport routes. Thus the connection value of a single industry can be counted several times. Particularly exciting is the title giving city of Birmingham. With the creation of infrastructure alone you can gain a lot of victory points even without having built a single industry there. Because network victory points can also be gained by building links to industry tiles of your opponents. Every connection that has been properly calculated and evaluated is taken off the board so that it is not accidentally counted twice. Less complicated are now the industries, whose victory point value is simply to be read on the flip tiles at the bottom left and valued accordingly. Tiles that have never been flipped are not counted. When the second era is over, the game is over and the winner is determined. If the second era is still to be played, all normal cards are reshuffled and 8 of them are given to each player as hand cards. Remaining wild cards are put back in their place on the board. The merchant's reward beer is put back in place and we are ready to move on to the rail era. I hope that I have explained everything clearly so that nothing stands in your way to start playing Brass Birmingham now. This is my first video translated into English, please have mercy. I appreciate your feedback. Feel free to let me know what I can do better. More instruction videos will follow. See you soon.